Thanks, Ramses, for the introduction. Welcome, everybody, to the seminar. My name is Johan Meron, and I'll be talking about web scraping in Python. So what is web scraping? Web scraping is the art of extracting data from websites. And I'm calling it art. Obviously, it's subjective because there's no real one size fits all. You really need to customize your web scraping code to whatever website you're scraping. That being said, there are basic steps in every web scraping project. And these are programmatically retrieving URLs, downloading each web page, and possibly rendering dynamical content. Later, we'll get to what it means exactly. Parse the HTML, extracting the information that you need, and then storing it in some kind of database. And importantly, those steps repeat. At Synot, we're the business of high-performance computing. Web scraping at scale is a high-performance computing task, but normally the computing needs are quite modest and your laptop or desktop machine would be quite sufficient for this. What is it good for? So if you're listening to this talk, maybe you already have some idea of what you can do with data that you get from the internet. So just briefly, Data harvesting can be used for research, commercial, and personal purposes. I actually started web scraping for completely personal reasons before I realized how broadly useful that is. And with the data, you can do statistical analysis. You can train machine learning models. You can create alerts. For example, when product that you're interested in that satisfies some criteria becomes available at some online store, you can do visualization, and so on. In this seminar, we will first discuss the legal and ethical considerations of web scraping. That's coming up in the next slide. We learn the basics of the web and HTML documents. We'll see how to retrieve and parse HTML in Python. Then I'll show you an example where we try to bypass the website completely and get directly to the data source. Then hopefully we'll still have time to see how to render dynamic page content with Selenium. And lastly, we'll talk about bot detection avoidance. That is what to do when the website really doesn't want to be scraped, but you're going to do it anyway. After this one hour, I don't expect anybody to become expert in this field if you're not already are, but there's plenty of further learning material online, video tutorials, you name it. If you have some web scraping project in mind, you can very easily find how to do this. So we start with the legal and ethical considerations. An important disclaimer is that I'm not a lawyer or an ethicist. What I'm going to tell you is my best understanding, but if you really need to know, then please consult an expert. First question, is it legal? And obviously, if it wasn't legal, we wouldn't be giving a talk about it. So scraping publicly available information is not against the law in Canada. However, the act may constitute a breach of the terms of service of a website. And that means that if you're caught web scraping, they can block you. And depending on what you're doing with the data, you can open yourself up to litigation. Publicly available material may still be under copyright. So if you download it, you still may have some restrictions of what you're allowed to do with it. And finally, I think it goes without saying that if the material violates PIPEDA or other laws, then storing it by itself may be illegal. Beyond the legality, is it ethical? So from the point of view of the company that owns the website that's being scraped, it does incur some amount of cost to them. They might be assuming a certain amount of revenue per gigabyte of network traffic. And if you're web scraping, their website, and many other people are web scraping the website, then you basically bring in little or more realistically no revenue while 
taking up a lot of their bandwidth. And maybe you don't feel sorry so much for Amazon and Microsoft and big companies like that, but if you're web scraping small or medium-sized companies, then you could actually causing some significant damage. And related to this is that badly done scraping constitutes a denial of servers attack. What does that mean? Is that, again, you're taking up a lot of bandwidth and the servers need to deal with your web scraping to such an extent that they have less resources to serve the more legitimate visitors of the website. So again, you might be hurting small or medium-sized companies by doing that. But I'm, I'm saying badly done web scraping because you can, in fact, slow down your web scraping such that it doesn't interfere with other users so much. Another business consideration is that bulk data may be offered for sale. And if that's the case and you're just scraping it for free or essentially free from, from the internet, then you might be hurting the, the company's business that way. And then lastly, there are broader questions about training AI models on publicly available material. That's been discussed quite a lot in the past year or so, but we're not going to get into it. So for academics, please consult your institution's ethics board if you have any doubt. And for people from the industry, I'm sure you have a legal department or some something equivalent. Let's talk about the web part of web scraping. So I'll give you a brief introduction to the World Wide Web. By the year 1991, computer networking has become quite mature. The internet had many applications such as file transfer, email, news and discussions. It was still missing an application for content sharing on demand. Then came the World Wide Web out of CERN, the research institute in Europe. And that brought in two major technological innovations. One was the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. The other was the Hypertext Markup Language, or HTML. Hypertext refer to text documents that are interconnected by links. This is a one slide crash course in HTTP, which I'll remind you is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And in this simplified picture, we have two computers. One acts as the client, it's running a web browser. The other acts as a server, it hosts the website or multiple websites. And between them, we have something called a TCP connection. Never mind what it is exactly, it's actually quite interesting. But for now, let's just think about it as a pipe that supports communication or data transfer in both directions. So when you start your web browser and you type an address like www.example.com slash something.html, or you press the link that sends you there, then what your browser does is it creates something called a request. So it's basically just a piece of text that looks like this. So it starts with the word get, and the get is the type of the request that you're making. It's called HTTP verb. Then follows the path of the resource that we're looking for, in this case, something.html. And then the protocol and the version that's HTTP 1.1 in this example. After this, we have a bunch of headers. And more realistically, there would be many headers. But in this case, there are only two, just for simplicity. The host tells the server which host, which website this resource is in. So again, because the server can host multiple websites, then it kind of disambiguates this, uh, the resource. And then we have the user agent header, which is the client, the web browser in this case, 
identifying itself. So it's saying this is Firefox version 120. Then it has some information about the operating system and the graphics server. And you may be asking yourself why we're sharing this information with a server. And it'll be very right in asking, but we're not answering this today. So once, we, once this piece of text has been created by the web browser, it sends it to the server. The server receives it and it processes it. And in due time, it responds. And this is how an HTTP response looks like. It also starts with a protocol. Then you have a status code. So 200 means OK. The request can be fulfilled. Another famous status code is 404 when the resource is not found. Then there are also headers for the response. And maybe the one that I want to focus on is this content type. So this something.html is not necessarily a file that exists on the server. This is just the path of the resource, but it can be anything. The server decides how to respond to this request. Often, it will indeed be a file that just exists on the server, but sometimes it's a dynamically generated page. It may be something completely different. It, it, the fact that it ends, the, the extension is HTML, doesn't mean that it has to be an HTML file. But this, this way, with this header, the server is telling us that it indeed, indeed responds with an HTML file. So after the headers, we have a blank line, and then we have the content itself, also called the payload, which in this case is the HTML. And we'll see what, what those things mean. What I want you to take from this is that browsers don't do any magic. We can write a, a program in Python or in another language that sends requests and receives responses basically imitating a web browser, in a sense. Finally, the reality in 2023 is much more complicated. For example, we rarely use plain HTTP anymore. Now the more common protocol is HTTPS, where there's an extra layer that provides encryption of most of the information here. Also, this is HTTP 1 or 1.1. The newer versions of the protocol, HTTP 2 and 3, they work a little bit differently. But the web still works on the principle of requests and responses. So no matter that this picture is simplified, we will still need to make requests and process responses. So this is a one slide crash course on HTML or the hypertext markup language. So this is how it generally looks like. It starts with this line that is the doc type or ju basically just identifying this document as an HTML document. An HTML document comprises of multiple elements nested within the root or HTML element. So everything underneath it. An element has a tag and possibly attributes. So the tag of the element is whatever comes immediately after the angle bracket. So there's an HTML tag, there's a head tag, there's a meta tag. And the attributes come after this. So this meta tag has char set as an attribute. And you can have multiple attributes like here. Normal elements have start and end tags and can have child elements. So you see this, this is the start tag of head, this is the end tag of head, and all of these are called the child elements. But some elements are void elements and they only have a start tag and no children. So meta, for example, doesn't have an end tag. The HTML document is comprised of two main parts. We have the head, which is the metadata element, and body, which contains the elements that are actually going to be rendered on screen. 
Among the attributes, you have many, but two are kind of special. So ID is an attribute that's guaranteed to be unique or it's supposed to be unique. And the importance of this is that when we're doing web scraping, as we'll see later, we need to select various HTML elements here. And the easiest thing is to select something by its ID. That's not always possible, however. What classes are, it's, they're related to style. So for example, this, this is a P element. So P stands for paragraph. And the, the classes here mean that the browser will apply the fancy style class and the centered style class to whatever is inside. And where those classes are defined, usually they're in an external file called a style sheet. And we're not going to talk about that. It's not really relevant for web scraping. But just the fact that we have those classes helps us identify specific elements on the web page. So for example, we can select this paragraph by saying we want a P element or an element with a P tag with classes fancy and or centered. So we'll, we'll see this in more detail after. And going back to the protocol for a second, after we loaded the HTML page, the browser will make additional HTTP requests to the server for needed resources. So for example, this styles.css is an additional file and the browser needs to make an, another HTTP request in order to obtain it. Same goes with the image. The image is just an external file, and we need another request for it. The basic web scraping tools. So the, the title of this talk is web scraping in Python, so no great surprise that Python is a great language for this task. Python is probably the number one data science language today. And Python is maybe known to be a slow language, but since the bottleneck in web scraping is usually the network, a fast language like C++ won't do any better. But Python is especially useful because of its great ecosystem of packages that will really help us write short codes that do quite a lot. So what packages are available for these tasks. Making HTTP requests is one essential step in web scraping. And the requests package, very originally named, is one option that we can use. It's probably the most popular one. Uh, HTTPX is an alternative. They differ in implementation somewhat and in performance. But requests is maybe the more popular one, so we're just going to use that. After we retrieve the HTML, uh, we can use the beautiful soup, a more originally named package, to parse it. And here, too, you have choices. So select LX or LXML. They, again, differ in implementation. But maybe more importantly, they differ in how they treat bad HTML. So if a website has HTML that doesn't really comply with the standard, that it's broken somehow, a web browser may still show it relatively OK, or at least as the author intended. But then it becomes very difficult to parse programmatically. And Beautiful Soup is known to do a good job, even if the HTML is not completely correct. Finally, after you extract the data that you want, then you would want to store it somehow. And you can do anything you like. That's not really part of web scraping. I personally like SQL Alchemy. It's a nice object-oriented package that helps you organize your data and also put them in relational databases. It supports quite a few different databases. But you can do, as I said, you can use your favorite data processing or data storage package. For simplicity, in the examples that I'm going to show you, we're just going to use the print function and print 
thing to, to screen. An honorable mention of the Scrapy package. So Scrapy is a Python framework for web scraping, meaning that it's kind of a all-in-one solution for web scraping. And I think code that's written with Scrapy is, is quite elegant, but it doesn't actually provide any functionality that you don't have with the more basic tools. And the learning curve is a little bit steep. I do suggest that you start your journey with requests and beautiful soup. And then if you really get into the habit of web scraping, then, then look into Scrapy. And there are also tons of commercial options, including coding free ones, meaning that they're GUI based, at least that's what they purport to be. I've never tried any of these, um, but if you have money and you're not very interested in this DIY approach for web scraping, then definitely check those out. So let's start with, with our first or zeroth example of weather data. So I'm going to open this link and let's see what it is. So we have this weather report website. So this is uh, also, it, it contains historical data for weather in some station, that's the airport. And for various days of the month, we have maximum temperature, minimum temperature, etc. Then we can go to previous month and we can change the, the station as well. So what we can do is to write some code in Python that will retrieve this page, will process the table, will look at every cell and see what day and what datum it refers to, and then move on to the next page or the previous month, do the same thing and change the station. So that sounds like a sort of medium difficulty web scraping project, but this is much easier than you think, and that's why it's not the real example, it's just a zeroth example. If we look carefully, we see this get more data link here. And if we click it, maybe we get this kind of unfriendly list of files. But if we explore it and see that this command line english.txt has some instructions of what commands we can run in the terminal in order to retrieve all the data and even more data. So this is hourly, then we have daily and monthly as well. And this appears to be in CSV format, which is very easy to, to handle. So the conclusion here, or the twist, is that the data is already easily available in CSV format, so we don't need to do anything. And that is quite common in government websites or data that is the result of publicly funded research. Sometimes you just have to look for it or maybe ask nicely and you'll get the data and save yourself the trouble of web scraping. So this is something that you always need to keep in mind. Web scraping is sort of like a last resort when you need your data. So now let's get to the first real example and that's scraping bookstore information from this so what we have here is a kind of imaginary bookstore. So everything here is just for you to practice. And But it looks, in terms of format, like many online stores, so that every product is in a different rectangle. And you have multiple pages. And our goal is to scrape the names, the prices, and the star counts of the various items in all those pages. So let's see how we go about doing that. So that's the code. It's only 23 lines long, so not very long at all. Let's go over it line by line and see what we do. So we start by importing packages. And I already told you about requests and beautiful soup. That's how you import them. And here we have this function, URL join, 
that's only doing some string parsing is not really necessary, but it makes life a little bit easier. In reality, when you have a big web scraping project, you have plenty of imports. So that's, that's obviously the requirement. Here we define in a variable called URL what the address is that where we start our search. And then we're going to loop over all the pages on the website. And the way we're going to do it is by using an infinite loop. And then at some point, we will look for this next button and see when it disappears, then we know to break from the loop. But we'll do it later. First, we need to make the HTTP request to the server. And we do this just with this line. So response equals request.get URL. The next stage is to parse the HTML response, which we do in this line. So response.text gives us the actual source code of the response, the actual HTML for the response. And never mind what this is, we need to choose a parser, but now soup is sort of processed version of this HTML where beautiful soup looked at the different elements and understood their hierarchy. And now we can do some operations on those elements. And just a comment in this line, I had to sort of fix some issue with the encoding of the web page. It seems to be unique to this particular web page. This is not always necessary. So just a small comment about that. Okay, so now we have the, we made the request, we received the response. So now we need to process it somehow and extract the information that we need. So let's go back to the web page and try to figure out how to, to do just that. So let's select, so we, we are interested, for example, in the title. So first of all, we see that in some books, the title doesn't even appear fully. There are those ellipses at the end, so it's truncated. But when we hover, we see the full title. I don't know if you can actually see what I see when the mouse is hovering. But anyway, when I hover the mouse, I see the full title. So what I'm going to show you now is the trick of clicking the right mouse button, which in Firefox at least opens this menu, and I can click on Inspect. I think in Chrome it works pretty much the same way. I don't know about other browsers. So let's do that. And that opens up something called the dev tools. That, that has many different tools that do very interesting things, but we're interested in this inspector where we can, first of all, we see the exact element in the source code that corresponds to whatever we just clicked, but we can also hover our mouse on other elements and then see what they correspond to on the actual web page. I hope it, that you can actually see it. Anyway, so what we see here that it seems that each of those items is a Lee element. Lee means list item. And within each of those Lee items, you have just a single article element. So what we can do to get all those uh, items is just to select specifically elements that have the article tag. And then we will process them individually. So that is what we're doing in the next line. We're doing soup.select, and inside we have a string that says article. Now, soup.select is, or select is a member function of this beautiful soup object. And what it does is it selects all the elements in the soup element, which is just our HTML page, that correspond to the string. And the string is in a language called CSS selectors. And let me just show you that CSS selectors is kind of, the, it's like a specification. It tells you exactly how you can select a particular element in the web page. So you can just look it up online and, and see the exact syntax. But when you just have 
the name here without anything else, it means select all elements that have the article tag. And the result would be a Python list where each element is one HTML element of tag article. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to loop over all the article elements in that list and process them individually. First, we want the title. So now we're using another function that select one. It's basically the same as select, but instead of the list, it just returns the first element that it sees that matches this. CSS selector that we have. So let's go back to the web page. And we see that, so we're looking for the name. And we see here that the name is within the A element. So we see the A element has a text, which is a brief history and then three dots. So that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is the title attribute of the A element. So we need to select this A element, and we see that it's underneath an H3 element. So perhaps within this article, we have more A elements, but only one, but we only have one H3 element. You see there are four children to this article element. One of them is H3. So we want to select the A, which is underneath an H3. H, by the way, stands for heading. So that's how we do this here. When in CSS selector language, you have H3 space A, it means select the A, which is underneath H3. And again, select one just means select the first that you see like that. In this case, there's only one. And then we can access the title attribute with just the square brackets operator. So that's it. Here we got the title from the, as, just as a string. So here, article is sort of an HTML element. It's a beautiful soup object. But now, title is just a string. OK, the next things are quite similar, not big difference. So in, in, in price, we see that is quite a compound expression here. So let's start from the inside. Again, we have a CSS selector, select one. Now we have this dot. So let's see where how the price is expressed in the web page. So again, we just select the element. And we see that it's in a P element that has a class of price color. And then we have the price, but the price has this British pound sign that we want to get rid of if we just want to convert this string into a float or, or a number. So that's what we do. So we select the P element that has class price color, and this is what the dot means. And then we extract the text. So the text is what is the content. So between the start and end tag, this is the dot text of the element. And again, to get rid of the first character, we just do this slicing. So now we should get the, the number, I think it was 54 point something, and float will convert this into a floating point number. OK, so now we have the title and the price. The last thing is to get the number of stars. So let's go back to the web page and see how we get the number of stars. So again, inspect. So now we see that those stars appear in as you know those I elements. It it seems quite difficult to handle, but luckily, all those I elements are nested within a P element, and this P element has two classes, one being star rating. And the other is five in this case, but here we'll see that it's probably one. Yeah, so the second class is the number of stars, but written in words. 
So how can we deal with that? Again, we select the P element that has the class star rating. So that's what we do here. Then we access the class attributes, but class differently to other attributes gives us not a string, but a list of strings. And then we choose the class with index one, which is the second class, which would be the number of stars, but in words. And to convert the number of stars from words to, to an integer, we just use this dictionary. And the number in words is just the key here. And the number as an integer is the value. So that's how we do this conversion. And that's pretty much it. Now we can print this item or the, the data for, for this item. And we repeat, of course, for all article elements within this HTML document. Now, that is again, just one page. And now we want to know if this is the last page or not. And the way we do this is by, again, using a CSS selector. So we're looking for, let's see, this next button. So I inspect it again. And I see that now it's an A element. Links are always within A elements. And it is underneath a Lee element that has a class next. So how this can be chosen is as Lee.next. So tag Lee class next. And underneath it, an element with tag A. So if this is found, if the, this A element exists, then th this thing, this um, uh, expression will evaluate to true, and then we can extract the URL of the, the, that is in this, that is here. However, this is a relative URL, and we need to sort of find the absolute URL, and, we do, and this is what this URL join is for. But we can just do it by string parsing uh, many. If we didn't find anything, then this will be non, so next link will be non, and then this will evaluate to false, and then we just break. That's it. So the output, you can convince yourselves that looks something like that. And uh, yeah, that concludes our first example. Okay, some extra comments about this. Error handling is a must. So as you can see here, we did some stuff that are kind of prone to failure. For example, if one of those article elements didn't have an A element underneath an H3 or construct a little bit differently, couldn't access this title attribute, this will raise an error and will crash our web scraping code. And you know, especially when your web scraping is automated, th that could be very bad. So you always have to assume the, the worst. And if one item has not been parsed correctly, then you just move on. Similarly, Checkpoints when scraping massive amounts of data are, are needed. So you, you're not likely to be able to finish your web scraping in one run. You would usually have to stop and resume. So you need to know where you stopped so you can continue without redoing what you already did. And maybe the most important thing is that books.toscrape.com, the website that We've just been scraping is an extremely scraping friendly website. Reality is much more difficult. And the next examples will start showing things that are a little bit more difficult. Okay, so let's talk about the next topic, which is dynamic web content, which is the start of the difficulty, but by no means the end. So what is JavaScript? JavaScript 
is a scripting language used to create content dynamically by manipulating the DOM. So DOM is document object model. It's basically what we've been seeing. So this HTML source code is also called the DOM. The difference maybe is that DOM refers to something that can be manipulated on the fly. Elements can be created and removed with code. So let's see what's going on in this uh, simple example. We have a simple HTML document. In this case, it only has a body and has a paragraph here, ID content, and it only has a string, hello. And when the web page loads, it will initially only show a paragraph with a text, hello. But then we have the script element and the browser will see it and process it and it will execute this JavaScript that's within this script element. So this is not a text. This is the actual code that needs to be kind of pseudo compiled and run. I'm sure you can figure out what this actually does or, or how it's doing it, but it will modify the text here from hello to hello world. So dynamic web content cannot be scraped like in the bookstore example, because if we did this with a previous script and we try to select the, this paragraph, what we would get is, is just the word hello, but this is not what we're seeing on the web browser. The request Python package only retrieves the HTTP response. So it's this HTML source code it cannot execute the JavaScript and render the page like a browser. Another small point is that it does take some time to fully render the page if the script is complex. So in this case, it will probably be instantaneous. So if you just load it, you will see the string hello world. But more generally, it, it could take up to a few seconds for the page to fully load. And that's something that you need to keep in mind when you when you're doing web scraping. Okay, another example, and it's also not a not too difficult, is this movie information website over here. That's another website. We see that it has those links here, and we can click them and see different movies and title, number of nominations, awards, whatever. We would think that we can use the same trick and look at inspect and look how they're constructed, how the page is constructed and, and parse it accordingly. But in this case, this content is dynamically generated with JavaScript. It doesn't, it doesn't appear in the source code. In fact, so we can copy like one of the titles here. And if you press Control U, this in Firefox, we get the HTML source code as it's seen, for example, by the Python requests package. And we see that here, the, the, this string doesn't even appear. So that, that's a, that tells us for sure that this is dynamically generated somehow. Another clue is that when, whenever we click um, one of the links here, we don't seem to be navigating out of the web page. We're, we're staying on the web page, but the, we have the spinning wheel and then the content changes. And also, if you look at the bottom left of my screen, you see the links, they don't actually appear to be different pages. It's just the same page. So this is a clue that it's where we're dealing with dynamic web content. So what can we do now? We can do this. Let's go back to the dev tools. We can do this by pressing F12, again in Firefox, I'm not sure about Chrome. And now let's go to the network tab. So that's another dev tool that's quite important. And let me load the page. 
Yeah, and uh, these here are the requests that the browser has made to the server or on our behalf. You, you can see the, the request headers here and the response headers here and the status code and a whole bunch of interesting stuff. This is the HTML page. So obviously when we started, we needed to retrieve the HTML page. But then as I told you, there are other resources, like for example, the style sheet, some JavaScript files that are additionally downloaded or additionally requested. So let's press. So this is the last request that was made. Let's press one of the links here. We see that another request was made. The content type, remember we talked about content type, is JSON. JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's a pretty simple database file or file type. And if we can actually look at the response itself and see that all the information is here in a very easily parsable format. In fact, but when we make the request, we will see it in raw form. And this is the response. And Python actually has a package to parse this. So instead of parsing the HTML here, we can just make this request retrieve the JSON instead of the HTML, and then our work is done. We get all the information that we need. The only thing that we need to understand is what is the resource that is being requested. So in this case, it's, it has this address that it's, of course, relative to the website. Year equals 2010, and if we go to 2011, we, we just get for every year the appropriate. We just have the, the parameter set like so. So how do we deal with this in Python? What, what we're going to do is basically bypass the web page entirely and go directly to the data source that provides us with this JSON. And this is the code. Very simple, nine lines. We import requests. But now instead of beautiful soup, we just need JSON. Now the URL is kind of this format string that we later format with the appropriate year. So we just loop from 2010 to 2016, not including 2016. We use the request package just as we did before. We request this URL, but we substitute year for the actual year we're interested in. And now we can use the load s uh, function from the JSON package to parse response.txt. And then now we have data, which is a list of dictionaries, where each dictionary is this kind of object, like here. And now it's trivial. We just print, or we just iterate the elements in this list. And for each one, we print the title, year, awards, nominations from this movie uh, item. Yeah, so that's super simple. Some comments about that. This is hardly considered web scraping. The hard part was figuring out the API access point, which we did here. The data, as I said, came to us in JSON format, which is much easier to handle than HTML. Now, in real situations, API requests may be refused unless a cookie or another header is provided. So I showed you request headers earlier. So one of them is called cookie that's used to identify a session or identify a unique session. And uh, there are other uh, types of headers that the server may be expecting, and it will only serve you the JSON or whatever other datum if a proper cookie is provided. So how to get this cookie if, if you're in an automated script is another very big question. 
It can be transplanted from a web browser, but then it expires quickly. But yeah, the, it's just another, another topic. Okay, we have five minutes. Uh, let's see how far we can go. And if I can finish, maybe I'll record something and add it to the recording. So we have this extra web page that we're going to scrape. And let's see how it looks like. It's just a list of quotes. And what we're interested in now is to just get the tags here. So this is a tag not in the context of HTML tag. It's just like the, the topic of the quote. So this is also a dynamically rendered content. And I know this because of, I chose this, this example. But here, if I refresh the page, you don't see any request for JSON. In fact, if we look at the source code, so we, let's try to find this in the source code of the page, we see that it appears, but it doesn't appear within the HTML. It appears within the script. Now, in this case, it might not be too difficult for us to extract, to, to kind of parse the string of, of the script, but more generally, it would be virtually impossible. Sometimes there would be no choice and we will have to execute the JavaScript. So in this case, the data source is not reachable or maybe not useful. We can use something called the Selenium web driver to control an actual web browser from Python. Now Selenium or Selenium web driver is mainly meant for testing websites, not for web scraping but can be used for web scraping nonetheless. This is much slower than retrieving the response using requests, but sometimes, like now, we just don't have a choice. There are alternatives to Selenium, for example, Puppeteer, Playwright. I think this is by Google, this is by Microsoft. I've never tried them. This is how our code looks like. And I think in three minutes, I can't go over it line by line. Just want to demonstrate what, what is going to happen when we start selling so that I can do it in three minutes. So first, I just copy, I just open the terminal. I'm just copying those import statements. And something went wrong. OK, I need to copy them one by line, apparently. It's just because I'm copying from the web browser. OK, now I will also put in the URL. And now this will create an instance of the web driver. So let's see how that looks like. So I hope you can see this. So now. I have a Firefox window open, and it's blank. But it also has this nice robot symbol here that tells us that this instance of Firefox is actually controlled by some external program. And when I use the get method of driver, then, then then you see that it navigated into this web page. And now what we can do is to use other methods of this driver object to extract the code and parse it this way. Yeah, so now uh, rendered underscore HTML will actually have the rendered HTML after the JavaScript is executed, and we can process it in a similar way with beautiful soup. OK, this is the extra content. So what we do here is very similar to the bookstore example. If we go to the web page, we can inspect those tags and see that they are in an A element with a class tag, which is a bit confusing, but whatever. So the CSS selector is just a dot tag. 
So tag list is just a list of all those A elements. Then we iterate over them and we print the text of each one. So that's not very different from the bookstore example. However, how we navigate to the next page is a little bit different from before. Instead of using the beautiful soup functionality to find the next link and then load the next URL, we're using the Selenium web driver functionality. And we use driver.findElement and here we're telling it that we want to select by CSS selector. And the actual CSS selector is the same as we had in the bookstore example. I can show you that if we go to the next button and we click it, we see that it's an A element, which is underneath a Lee element with class text. So we select it in the same way, but now this is a Selenium object rather than a beautiful soup object. And the big difference is that we can now interact with it like a user. And the dot click here actually imitates user action. If this finding fails, so if this next button doesn't exist on the page, this will raise some kind of error. And then we interpret this as the end of the loop. So we just break. This imitation of user action is actually way more than just clicking links. So you can also, for example, fill in a form. And then finally, we quit the driver, which closes the Firefox window. And the output would look something like that. Some comments. Yeah, as I said, we could get the next link just like in the bookstore example, but we're going to show you how to imitate user action. And also, as I mentioned briefly earlier, rendering the page with JavaScript could take some time. And the remedy is that Selenium has mechanisms to wait for an element to appear on the page before it's being parsed or before it's being interacted with. Yeah, very importantly, that the browser can usually run in headless mode, meaning that we won't see the browser on our screen, it will just be running in the background, and that's very important for automation. The last topic is about bot detection and avoidance of bot detection. So that is probably where the major difficulty of web scraping is but that's something that you will mostly have to learn on your own and from experience. So first of all, how do we know what a website's policy is with regards to scraping? We can always go to this robots.txt file in the root path of the website, and that file contains the site-specific rules. Now we can go to Wikipedia, for example, and learn how to interpret this robots.txt file. Regardless of whether you want to obey the robots.txt or not, the primary way to avoid detection, sort of the oldest trick in the book, is to try to appear more like a normal browser by including a realistic user agent header. So when you access a website via a browser, as we saw before, it tells the website which browser it is, but if you're scraping using requests, for example, then request sends some weird user header that doesn't appear as if it's coming from a browser. But you can manually change it and tell requests to send the same user agent that your browser has or some more realistic user agent. And you can also occasionally rotate the user agents. And what that means is that within your loop, you can use different user agents in different iterations, just so that the website has a harder time to figure out that it's a web scraping script that is trying to access it multiple times. Another small trick is that you can add a little bit of random sleep between requests. So in the examples that I've shown you, 
we just made the requests in a loop and that is way faster than a human can navigate a website. So if you add a little bit of sleep, then again it makes you look a little bit more like a human. And also if, if the requests come in very consistent intervals, then it's another indication that it's not really a human, so a random sleep is a little bit better. Another thing that is actually very important is to rotate the IPs using a proxy service. So that is a service that you need to purchase basically, but it can be quite cheap, where instead of making the request directly to the website that you're scraping, you're going through a proxy, so to the website that's being scraped, it appears as if the requests come from different sources. And especially if you combine rotation of user agent and rotation of IP, then you have a higher chance of avoiding detection. So despite the fact that Selenium is a real web browser, there are still ways for websites to detect that you're using an automated browser rather than a real human-controlled browser. And if you get detected, you may get blocked. And honestly, this is one of the harder things to remedy. One thing you can try to do, and you can search online what this means exactly, is to tweak the web driver. This could be quite hard, but another thing you can try is to change the web driver itself. We use the Firefox web driver in this example, but you can try, for example, undetected Chrome driver, which is sort of a third-party web driver that you can easily download and, and use within Selenium. However, I can tell you from experience, it doesn't always work, but you can try, it, it might be useful for you. Lastly, you will for sure encounter CAPTCHAs. So CAPTCHAs are difficult, but not impossible to tackle. So if you have time and you use Selenium in headed rather than headless mode, you can try to solve the capture yourself. That will allow your web scraper to run for at least a little bit. But if you encounter repeated captures, there are capture solving services. So those are paid services that you can integrate within your code. And what they do is they actually use humans to solve captures. And if you integrate them in your code, they can guarantee that they will solve your CAPTCHA within so many seconds, and you pay a certain set price per solution. And this is also very cheap. However, I can tell you there are ethical questions about the services as well, so you might want to investigate those carefully. And that's the end of the talk. Thanks, everyone.